Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today we have Benjamin Yoskovitz presenting Understanding the Value of Lean Analytics, Using Data to Build a Better Startup Faster. Ben is the author of the brand new O'Reilly book, Lean Analytics, and we're thrilled to have him with us today to present this webcast for you all. I will turn the program over to Ben in just a moment, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping things to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open the group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Ben. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Ben, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweets, so you don't have to, and our hashtag today is Lean Analytics, all one word. If you have any problems during the event, please take a look at the help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the chat room and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have an archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Ben for his presentation. Hello, Ben. Hi. All right, well, thank you, uh, Yasmin. I appreciate that. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to showing you a bit about what we're doing with um, the Lean Analytics book um, and sharing some of our key ideas around metrics and lean startups. So let me just first uh, introduce myself. Um, I started my first company in 96. I was still in school at the time. Um, that company was Aquahired. You can see I stayed with that company for a very long time. Um, you know, a lesson that I won't forget that I think it's easy to get comfortable in certain situations. Um, eventually I moved on. Uh, since then I started another B2B software company called Standout Jobs in the recruitment space. I started an accelerator called Year One Labs, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then I joined a company called Go Instant um, in October of 2010. Um, and just recently it was announced that um, Go Instant was acquired. Um, it was a very successful exit um, for everybody uh, by Salesforce. And so I'm currently uh, VP product of Go Instant, uh, product manager for Salesforce, and working on um, uh, working on Go Instant and the integration into uh, into a large company as uh, Salesforce is. Um, I mentioned um, Year One Labs briefly in the previous slide. So um, we were a small accelerator program based in Montreal, and we raised a, what you would call like a micro, uh, super micro fund almost. We invested in five startups. Um, all of those startups were consumer focused. So while much of my experience is B2B, Year One Labs was a, a really B2C experience. Um, and what was interesting about Year One Labs is that we had a lean methodology that we put the startups through. So we gave them up to 12 months. Um, and it was a lean process that they had to walk through in order to just sort of go through these stages or these gates and then get out to the other side. Um, and our goal, they, we took them very early, in some cases almost pre-idea, putting teams together and tried to get them almost to or, or to product market fit in that time frame. Um, ultimately, I think Year One Labs, you know, we think of it as a success. You know, the metric for that a bit of a vanity metric, if you will. Three of five of those companies went on to raise capital. Um, and I still work with a number of those companies in an advisory capacity. Um, so now I'm spending most of my free time, uh, whatever time I have, writing Lean Analytics book with my co-author, Alistair Cole. 
Um, and so I think Yasmina is going to be posting links or something. I, you know, we're, I think we're the deal of the day today, so 50% off or something like that on, on the early release of the book, and you can start to read a few of the chapters. Um, it says wrong subtitle there because this is a cover that we had made, and you know, we're taking a lean approach and an analytical approach to our book, and so we've tested different titles out, different uh, book covers, and so it's just sort of funny that there's the wrong subtitle, but you know, these are things we're always uh, improving on. Um, so uh, I want to cover a number of things today. I'm going to do sort of a bit of a refresher, if you will, on Lean Startup because it's some important context. Um, and for me, the future of business really is Lean. Um, so I'm sure most people are familiar with this, but it helps us just uh, focus on, you know, how analytics applies to the Lean Startup process. Um, and so first thing I want to say is that Silicon Valley uh, doesn't love failure. I don't think that that's actually true. It just hates it less than the alternative. And that alternative is very simply building something nobody cares about. Um, and what Lean Startup really helps codify for us is the importance of the problem. If the problem you're trying to solve isn't painful enough, you're, you're going to struggle. It's going to be a difficult go. And so before you go and spend a lot of time and money building something um, and, and investing sort of your heart and soul into something, it's really better to understand if the problem you're solving is even worth solving in the first place. Um, I think it's also important to point out, and we do mention this in the book, that you need to really care about the problem you're trying to solve. So you may, in, in the course of uh, discovery and customer development, you might find a worthwhile problem, but it doesn't really get you excited. Um, it doesn't really drive you every single day to go out and, and run this or start this company. It's not a problem you should be solving. So really just let someone else do it. Um, find something that you're passionate about. That's really important. Um, chances are you're familiar with this uh, diagram from Eric Ries, Build, Measure, Learn, is, is really the key to running through the Lean Startup process and the key to understanding how, the, how analytics fits in. Um, so the basic Lean message is learn and adapt fast. Um, and sort of, you know, yesteryear, and, you know, many years ago, uh, we used to focus on getting prepared, we used to focus on planning, writing big and complete business plans, and then eventually getting to the actual execution part. Um, and I think we now know it's better to aim, fire, and then be ready. So pick a target, do something, experiment, figure out the results, and iterate your way to being ready, um, and ultimately to being successful. And so I, you know, I think of this as different things matter now. So you know, getting features right matters less. Knowing what's not working quickly matters more. Building product matters less. Finding no needs matters more. We should matters less. What if matters more. Your roadmap matters less. Oh, that's why it's coming. Parallel experiments matters more. Um, and business plans matter less. Business models matter more. So I'm showing this again because uh, it's just a good reminder, uh, you know, basic lean startup approach. And I believe that this works for all stages of a startup and a company. Um, it works for validating a problem as well as it works for feature development or sales and marketing. And lean analytics, of course, fits in on the measure aspect. So the real question is, how do you measure the progress that you're making? Um, and the reason it's so important is this. We're all liars. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, you know, but entrepreneurs are notorious liars. Uh, we, in, in fact, we have to be. So, you know, in order to wake up every day, face these huge challenges that we face, jump into the unknown, you have to have a reality distortion field around yourself. Um, but the problem comes when that reality distortion field gets so impenetrable that you become delusional. Um, and I think we've all had moments where we've experienced this and realized this. Um, and it's, it's important to get through that. And Lean Startup and Lean Analytics are really designed to break through that reality distortion field and give you a framework for succeeding. So having said that, I don't think you can completely codify success. Um, I don't believe there's, like a, there's no mathematical formula, um, at least not one that I found or an easy one, to build a successful startup. Um, so it's really important with all of this talk around process, you can't ignore your gut. Gut instincts are inspiration. And you'll need to listen to your gut on rely, and rely on it for the startup journey. Just don't disembowel yourself. So guts matter. You've just got to test them. Instincts are experiments. Data is proof. Um, and so, you know, very simply, uh, uh, the way I think about this is your guts plus lean analytics increases the likelihood of success, and that's really the goal. Identify and eliminate risk, reduce waste, and improve the odds that you'll win. Um, so, uh, Part two is really just going through some of the basics of what I call good analytics. So analytics is the measurement of movement towards your business goals. 
And in a startup, the purpose of analytics is to iterate the product market fit before the money runs out. In the book, we talk about three categories of metrics, and I just want to sort of cover each group a little bit. Um, so qualitative and quantitative, I think we all know quantitative is the stuff that we measure. The qualitative metrics are those that are difficult to measure and process. So particularly if you're in the midst of doing problem or solution interviews with, with prospects or users, you'll know what I'm talking about. Quantifying user feedback at these stages is very hard. So you have to become great at interpreting qualitative feedback. Um, this is stuff like, you know, how people are reacting, what's their body position, like these are the kinds of things that are important um, cues to helping you understand if people are really engaged in what you're talking to them about. Um, and in the book, we actually do propose a way of scoring problem interviews. You may have seen this also on our blog. Um, and I, I think it helps convert some of the qualitative data into quantitative uh, analysis, but you really have to gather and learn from qualitative information. You can't, you can't get away from that, particularly early on. Um, so vanity metrics, I mean, most of you are, are probably familiar with vanity metrics. I think we all tend to lean towards them because they're so easy to track and they often look really good. Uh, but when compared to actionable metrics, those that we can actually make decisions with, we realize how bad vanity metrics are for us. And then finally, exploratory and reporting metrics. So reporting metrics are, are accounting metrics. They help us keep score of stuff we know we care about. And exploratory metrics, on the other hand, are in the realm of the unknown unknowns. So these are things we don't know we don't know yet, but we want to dig into the data, look for trends and tidbits that help us come up with worthwhile experiments. So what makes a, a good or a great metric? So for starters, it needs to be comparative over time against the baseline. So in part, I'm, I'm talking here about sort of cohort analysis of different groups over time. Um, it needs to be understandable and dead simple. You need to be able to take this number, show it to someone who's not in your business, and they say, I get it, and I know what you're doing with that number. Um, ratios and rates are better than, uh, better than just numbers. Uh, and that's primarily for being able to compare, rate, you know, it's much easier to compare a ratio than it is to compare just raw numbers. So for example, percent daily active users is a lot more valuable than number of daily active users, which just doesn't tell us that much. For accounting metrics, they really have to improve the accuracy of our predictions. And for experimental or exploratory metrics, they have to change how we behave. So if you can't act on a number, then it's not a good number and probably not worth tracking. So let me move to the, the sort of um, meat of the book, the meat of uh, lean analytics, and these are sort of the key principles that I want to walk through. Um, one of the biggest challenges that startups have is figuring out what metric to track at any point in time. So um, we, Alistair and I look at two major vectors. We look at your business model, so basically how you're going to make money, and then the stage of your startup. So I'm not going to, today I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, uh, but we will do that in the book. So, you know, essentially mapping each business model to its key metrics, or its, its funnel of metrics, if you will, and then mapping that to the specific stage of your startup. And ultimately, what we want to do is give people an idea of what metrics they should track at any point in time for their business um, and why they should be tracking that number. So we look at a number of things for this, and one of the things we look at are, are a number of analytical frameworks. So, uh, and, and these are probably familiar with, but um, Dave McClure's Pirate Metrics is a good example of that. So um, AARRR stands for Acquisition, Activation, Retention, Referral, and Revenue. Um, and I think this is a great starting point for thinking about a basic funnel through your startup. Um, we're also going to combine in Eric Reese's engines of growth. So he describes these in his book, the sticky engine, viral engine, and price engine. So the sticky engine is all about building your startup off of engagement. The viral engine is about building your startup off of uh, virality. And ideally we're talking about real virality that's built into the product, not artificial vir uh, virality that you manufacture. And so the difference there is a product that gets more valuable over time when there are more people using it. And if that's true, then that product better be viral. Artificial virality is a landing page that encourages you to share that. And that's not a bad thing. It's just not the kind of virality that necessarily sticks around or you can build an actual engine of growth on. Um, and finally, we have the price engine, um, and, and this is really about building a business off of revenue metrics. So do I make more money per customer than I spend, and are the margins and the profits that I make good, and can I scale that? Another framework that we look at is, is what we call the long funnel. Um, so I know you probably can't see that diagram very well, but there's a bit.ly link if you want to just capture that, write it down. But this is also on our, um, on our blog. Uh, because this is a long funnel that we use, or, or what we produced, if you will, when we launched the book's website um, and started tracking results through Twitter and Facebook, and, and we used a number of influencers 
um, Avinash Kaushik, Tim O'Reilly, uh, Julian Smith, we asked these guys to tweet out and, and we were going to track the results and see which one of these influencers had more of an impact. Um, and so I think of the long funnel as a way of really understanding customer journeys and experiences through your website or your application, and really in, in many respects all touch points of your business. This could be touching customer service, phone calls, email, or a whole bunch of other things. And then the other thing is that it's really a combination of exploratory um, and reporting metrics. So there's reporting of, you know, how many people clicked on a certain link and what did those people do. But then when you look at the analytics as a whole, you discover trends in the data throughout the funnel that help you understand um, and, and, and generate new insights. Um, so out of all of these frameworks um, and sort of our basic assessment of mapping metrics to business models and startup stages, we've come up with what we describe as the gates of lean analytics. Um, and I realize this is a complicated slide. I try to, you know, generally try to avoid that. Um, but the goal here is actually to simplify things. So if you just focus on the orange boxes, you see the areas to focus on at any given stage for your business, which we call empathy, stickiness, virality, revenue, and attention. And then the gates that you need to go through to get from one stage to the next or to the right of that. Uh, so this is the core model or framework that we use in the book along with the six primary business models that we've identified to get an understanding of what metrics you should track and why. And so when you look at these gates, it's really just asking you specific questions. You know, so I, I figured out how to solve a problem in a way that uh, people will adopt and pay for, move from empathy to stickiness. Now, that specific gate or that description of that gate and pay for, they may pay for it with money, they may pay for it with attention. But the idea is to come up with a basic framework that applies in a lot of cases um, but certainly there's going to be variance um, to any model. No model is absolutely perfect. And ultimately we take this sort of framework um, that we're using in the book and we boil it down even further, um, right to sort of the next concept that I'd like to talk about, and that's the one metric that matters. Um, and the idea is to choose only one metric at any given time and focus entirely on it. And so some people will say that that's not actually possible to do, but really think of this as a concept of simplification and focus, which anybody can do. So if, you, if you're tracking 100 metrics, you can ask yourself, well, maybe I don't get to one, maybe I get myself down to five. Um, ultimately, if you are looking at too many numbers, it's very likely that you're going to get lost. And Avinash Kaushik, uh, he has this great term for it, he calls it data puking. If you look at one number, you know, you might miss secondary metrics, uh, but that's still better than getting overwhelmed and not being able to do anything with the data that you have. You're staring at this data, you can't make good decisions with it, and so we want people to really say, what's the number one thing I care about right now, based on my model and the stage that I'm at, what's the one thing I should focus on and go from there? Um, so the benefits of using this uh, concept of the one metric that matters, it really helps uh, focus on answering the most important question that you have. And generally, that means addressing the riskiest part of your business first. And I think we all understand that now, that that's really, um, you know, what we have to do. Don't go solve easy problems only to get caught later on. Um, the one metric that matters has a clear goal. So you know you want to move a specific number by a specific amount because you believe it will have a specific and positive result. And that's really just a good experiment um, or a good structure for experiments. And then the one metric that matters also helps focus your entire company. So particularly early on, this is, this is important. So you need everyone pulling in the same direction. And finally, the concept of the one metric that matters helps instill and encourage a culture of experimentation. So you give everyone a single thing to focus on. You say, figure out how to move the needle on this thing. And that's really giving people permission to experiment. And that's really important because a lot of times people um, – are cautious about experimenting because they know that some of those experiments, uh, experiments, if not all of them, are actually going to fail. Um, so, of course, your one metric that matters will change. It's, it doesn't stay the same throughout the course of life for your startup. So, as you move through the stages of your startup, um, the metrics that you care about are going to change, and that, that's totally normal. So. Um, in fact, we think of metrics like squeeze toys. This is sort of a good analogy. So you focus on one thing, you squeeze there, and then something else bulges, uh, bulges elsewhere. And then you discover the next thing that's important that needs your attention. Oh, uh, oh, somebody asked me a question here, so I'm just getting used to this format here. So um, is there an open source metrics analytics project that has become a de facto standard for the startup community? I actually don't know. That's a really great question. 
Let me follow up with Alistair. He's actually really um, more the expert on, on various tools, and let me see if I can find an answer to that at a, at a later stage. I don't know how I can get necessarily in contact uh, with you, Darren, when you ask the question, but I'll find out. Um, so I wanted to quickly walk through an example of, of the, the Gates and how this might work. So in this case, this is a SaaS freemium business. So using the Gates of Lean Analytics, you can see as you move from one stage to the next, sort of which numbers may be important and in what order. Um, there, and again, I said this, you know, there's always going to be variance. Every business is a little bit different, um, but that's not an excuse for not trying to measure things and track things and codify things. Um, and, and what we really want to emphasize here is that you focus on one major thing at any given time and that there's sort of a natural, fairly logical order to the steps. So, you know, as an example, this company shouldn't be focusing on the customer lifetime value before they've understood a whole bunch of other things like their churn and their conversion. Um, another critical component of Lean Analytics is what we call drawing lines in the sand. So even with a model for what metric to focus on at any given point in time, it's still very difficult to run successful experiments, um, and it's particularly difficult if you don't actually have goals in mind. So, um, you know, I'll just use an example. So let's say you're going to focus on conversion from a site visitor to a trial sign up on your website. A visitor comes, right now it doesn't matter how they get there, they're either going to not sign up for your free trial or they will. And so let's say, um, for argument's sake, that the number is 2%. You would like that conversion number to be higher. And the real question there is, well, how much higher? Um, and the key here is that you need to pick a target. So you need to draw a line in the sand so that you can experiment towards that. Um, and we describe it as a line in the sand as opposed to being set in stone because it can move. Um, and so we have examples in the book where companies had a line in the sand and then they realized through speaking with and learning from their customers that it could be moved. And so um, a particular example is a company that, you know, expected people to use their product a certain number of times per week. And they weren't hitting that number and yet they were talking to people and the feedback they were getting was, no, we're using it and we're getting value. And so they have to go back and really understand the behavior of their customers, understand the value they were creating, and then it was okay to um, adjust the numbers uh, or adjust the line that they had drawn and, and, um, and then allow themselves, if you will, to move through the gate to the next stage of their business. Um, and this process of drawing lines in the sand is very hard. Um, almost every single person I've ever talked to about this resists doing it. Um, generally, people don't like to commit to something, but also they don't know what the line should be. Um, and that's something that we're really trying to address in the book as well, which is really, you know, what are the ideal targets for specific metrics? Um, so I have some examples here um, of sort of, you know, we call what's ideal or what's normal or what you should aim for. Um, and again, this is sort of using my SaaS B2B uh, business example. So 2.5% um, churn per month. Um, if you're doing freemium, free to paid uh, in freemium of 2%. And, and what these numbers tell us is, let's say you have 2% churn or 3% churn or 2.5% churn, you might want to go look at other numbers instead of trying to constantly experiment on these because ultimately what you're going to see is, is diminishing returns. Because in our sort of research on these things, we're seeing that that's it's not the ultimate basement for that number. I'm sure there are examples where it can get lower, and there may be reasons to try to get it lower, but you might want to allow yourself the opportunity to go look at other numbers. So CLV is customer lifetime value, and what we've seen is that that needs to be three times your customer acquisition cost. And finally, um, the time to recoup your customer acquisition cost, so the time to recoup the money that you spent acquiring the customer should be in the six to 12 month range. Um, so the research we're doing on this and coming up with sort of what are the ideal numbers for a whole bunch of metrics is really a combination of things. It's from our experience, we're interviewing a whole bunch of companies, we're collecting research from other sources and, and more. And, and so this is nowhere near scientific. Um, you know, finding the ideal targets for specific metrics is really hard. Um, and there's just ultimately too many variables involved. But, you know, we're going to be publishing benchmarks for people to use anyway. And, then, and the goal is hopefully the benchmarks we provide in the book give people the courage to draw those lines in the sand uh, because we've seen how important that really is for succeeding. Um, oh, so I, I had another question about escape velocity. Let me just take a look at that here. Uh, can you talk a bit about, so asking can you talk a bit about escape velocity? So I, I think some of that may get covered a little bit later on, um, but I think the key there, if, 
I don't want to go back in the slides necessarily, but if we're thinking about escape velocity, I see that as being um, where you're looking for um, inherent viral growth. Um, so escape velocity is not something that you're going to necessarily achieve in a B2B business where you're selling to a company unless it's a bottom-up kind of approach. Um, but I see that as stickiness first, which is proof that there's some value for a small group of people, that people are engaged, that the, you know, the percent of daily active or weekly or monthly active is high enough and, and that the churn is low enough that you can then get inherent virality built in the, into the product and then that should increase the value and then that creates escape velocity. Um, we will have numbers in the book, I don't have them off the top of my head, that talk about you know, where virality should be, how it can be built into products. Um, and what escape velocity might look like. Um, so this is actually the last thing that I wanted to share today. So I'm actually doing incredibly well on, on time, um, which, is, which is sort of surprising. But um, this is something that we call, or, or the last thing I want to share with you is something called the problem solution canvas. Um, and this is something that we designed um, during year one labs as a way of helping startups focus on what really matters. Um, and then ultimately being able to communicate that with us as advisors and partners in their businesses. So if you're familiar with um, Ash Murray of Lean Canvas, um, which I'm a huge fan of, it's, it's you know, ultimately to think of it as a one-page business model that really helps you identify those areas of weakness in your strategy and those areas of risk. Think of the problem solution canvas um, as a level below that in terms of detail. So it's a way of tracking progress and key issues on a regular basis. And so we use this with companies on a weekly basis. Um, so the canvas has two pages to it. Um, it's very basic, and um, this version just happened to be done in PowerPoint. Um, and you can see that the title at the top is The Goal is to Learn. Um, and I think that this often gets lost uh, when you're neck deep sort of in startup craziness. Uh, but particularly early on, um, you know, learning from our users, learning from people's behavior, learning about what people are doing and being able to measure that is really the key. Um, so if we're looking at this canvas, we ask the founders to list their current status briefly, and the boxes are just like Lean Canvas, sort of limiting in their size on purpose, uh, and then talk about their lessons learned from the previous week. And so we actually left room um, in that top right-hand corner uh, for people to include past accomplishments, but this really wasn't the focus. Originally, we had called it accomplishments, and then too often startups will list things like, you know, getting articles in the press um, as an accomplishment. But, you know, really oftentimes, and particularly early on, that those kinds of accomplishments are, are, are completely meaningless to genuine progress, and certainly from a learning perspective. And so the core area on this first part of the canvas is really to list the top two or three problems that, that you're facing. Um, and, and again, here we see startups that are all over the map. Um, but really forcing them to list and rank problems really help us have productive conversations. Um, and often we would scrap what they thought were the key problems and discover what was really going on. So often you would, you would have a conversation here and it would be something along the lines of, well, um, we don't have enough users. And then you say, well, how many users do you have? And you say, well, 5,000. Okay, well, that's, you know, it's a, it's a number. Um, how many of them are using the product? Well, none of them are using it. Well, is our problem that we need 10,000 users or 50,000 users and we assume those people will use it, or is the problem that people are active in the product? And that's the kind of stuff that happens when you use something like the Problem Solution Canvas to try to really focus on what's really going on, what really matters, and then ranking those problems. Uh, the next part of the canvas takes the problems we've agreed on um, and puts them here in more detail. So um, on the left-hand side, you put the hypothesized solutions, um, and then you put the metrics or the proof that you'll be aiming for on the right. And so, so those metrics could be quantitative at some points, but it could also be qualitative proof. Um, and then you'll see on the left-hand side, it, it asks a simple question. It says, why do you believe each solution uh, that you're proposing here will help solve the problem? And so there could be multiple solutions, hypothesized solutions to a single problem. And, and what's interesting here is that asking why is a really simple thing to do. It's a really simple question, but it really ends up exposing a lot of weaknesses in people's understanding of the problems um, that they think they have or the weakness in the design of their experiments. 
And so, you know, I think, you know, I have this problem. I think this is the solution. Why do you think that's the solution? If you don't have a, a really um, significant answer to that, you probably don't have the right solution. You probably don't have the right design for an experiment that's going to give you the results that you want, which is validating or invalidating the solutions to those problems. Um, ultimately, for the, the problem solution canvas, the format of this doesn't really matter, except for the fact that um, you know, we're trying to fit certain things into certain size boxes so you don't have 20 problems because that's an impossible thing to focus on, or you know, 20 solutions to, uh, to a problem. Um, but you could do this on a whiteboard. I mean, we could have built an app for it. Um, we could have changed things around a little bit. But the goal is what really matters here. And the goal is to get to the heart of, of what a startup is focusing on at a present point in time and really to draw attention to running good experiments with good metrics and targets. Um, so that's actually the conclusion of the presentation. I do have, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of a sneak peek into the book. So, you know, we're quite a ways uh, through the writing. We're learning a lot of stuff. We're, we're, we're experimenting with a lot of things as well, and you'll see that on our blog. And I think if you're reading the early release of the book, and you, you'll re read future versions of the early release, and then ultimately the final version of the book, you're going to see a lot of change in that. And that's because we're iterating on our process, um, learning a lot of things, changing our thinking, but also taking in other people's thoughts and running experiments. And so here are some of the things that we're going to be working on. Um, so I described those six business models. And so what you're going to see in the book is here's six business models, six ways of making money, and here are the list of metrics that you should focus on for each one of those models in some form of order. Um, and again, that's not a perfect order. There's, there's obviously some variance and variables uh, for moving those things around. But if you're in a two-sided marketplace, um, my hope is if you're in a two-sided marketplace and you're just starting to validate the problem, you'll be able to know what to focus on. Or if you're in an e-commerce business and you've just launched your MVP, you'll know what metrics to focus on. And on top of that, you'll know what, what we call what's ideal or some benchmarks that you can aim for. Um, we're also going to be focusing portions of the book and some case studies and some examples um, on sort of every stage of the startup, but also for big companies and entrepreneurs. So that's not a, you know, we call this lean startup, and lean analytics is, of course, focused on startups, but we don't want to ignore um, that audience. It's extremely important and extremely challenging um, for bigger companies or, or entrepreneurs or, or people who are running departments inside of large organizations to think in a lean way and to apply lean analytics. So we want to help address some of those issues. Um, we have something called the penny machine, which I think is pretty cool, something called the three threes model. Um, we have a section on how crowdfunding fits in, and I think this is, um, you know, we're seeing crowdfunding as a viable way of testing your business ideas, testing some problems and the solution that you're proposing to those. Um, and so I think crowdfunding is an interesting way of validating through a lean startup model, and there's some real analytics to that that are very, very interesting. Um, also, again, I talked a little bit about this, but how to instill a culture of analytics. And I think this is very important, and I, I think this gets lost often. So a lot of people focus on lean startup and the methodology. And again, you can't just walk through a methodology like a zombie and expect to win. Um, it's really about a culture and a belief system that says, we're going to use analytics and experimentation. And so we want to help people figure out how to take their beliefs in, in using data and, and, and share that and share that value with other people within their organization across multiple departments. Um, and then we will have a lot of case studies in there. I know in the early release, if you've read that, there are many, um, but there are going to be many in there. Um, so, and here's some of the names of companies, and, and, and it, it ranges from you know, social networks to e-commerce companies to B2B software companies, game companies, um, big and small um, and startups that were in year one labs. So we've got case studies from those, but we also have case studies from companies like Airbnb um, and companies that have been acquired or companies that are still growing. Um, bootstrap, venture back, crowdfunding, these are all um, you know, examples of companies that we're going to be talking about so you can see how they're using numbers and the things that they're focusing on, um, including things like benchmarks. You know, so WP Engine talks about their churn number and, and how originally Jason, who runs that company, was concerned about churn, and then he went out and talked to other companies in his space 
and realize that that's about the, the right number for a pretty mature uh, hosting company. So then you say, well, I'm going to go focus on another number and not lose sleep on something that I don't need to waste time on. And it doesn't mean you ignore churn. It doesn't mean Jason ignores churn. It only means that he focuses a little bit less on it and he can move to other things like growth. If he knows churn is good, he can put more people through the top of the funnel. Um, so there will be a lot of case studies and hopefully people will, will get value out of sort of the story-driven approach to how we're writing the book. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I will take, certainly have time for questions. This went a little bit faster than I thought, but hopefully it was a good overview of lean analytics um, and you know, what is coming in the book and sort of the framework we're using for the book. Uh, you can go to leananalyticsbook.com and then my personal blog um, where I, I write about just you know, my experience as an entrepreneur, an investor, um, uh, you know, an employee now in a, a startup company that was acquired by a large company uh, is instigatorblog.com. Super presentation, Ben. Fantastic information. Lots of um, good information coming there. And boy, from the audience comments coming in, they're very, very interested in what you've been talking about. And we do have several questions that have come in. So folks, we are now going to get to Q&A. If you have not opened your group chat widget, please do open it. You can type your question in for Ben, send it in so he can answer it while he's with us. Back to you, Ben. Okay. So. Um I got a question that the link is wrong, so that's uh, on the long funnel, and I really apologize. <laughs> you think that's something I could get right? If you go to leananalyticsbook.com and you go to the blog, uh, you will find it there. And yes, I mean, I don't know if there's a way of emailing people after, but if people still want things like that, I can definitely send you the proper link. Perfect. Yep. Send us um, the information for folks. And folks, when we send you the email to let you know the archive of the event is ready, we'll make sure to include all those links in there for you. Back to you, Ben. Great. Okay. So that's one. Um, let me see here. Uh, hold on for a second. Um, yes. Um, okay. So I'm answering yes because I'm reading the question. So in the, I, I got a question here. In the book, do you discuss the examples of startups who were ignorant of uh, lean startup or analytics initially um, and then followed the principles and did well? So yes, we do. Um, in fact, we, I, this, is, this is very common, of course, because as, as uh, popular as lean startup is, um, a lot of people still don't really understand it or still haven't applied it to their business or certainly lean analytics. And so we talk about this idea, but one thing we talk about in the book is you have an existing product, let's say, and you realize you're not getting the traction you want. Instead of scrapping the product completely, try pointing the product at a different market. So instead of talking about product market fit, we talk about market product fit. So that's an example of that, and we will have uh, stories in the book about companies that you know, picked up on these principles after the fact and were able to do things like take a lot of metrics they were looking at and reducing them down, just as an example. Um, so I received a question here, does the book have suggested target metrics for each of the engines of growth and for each stage? So we're going to be, we, we use the engines of growth um, and you'll see the metrics in there, but we're lining them up a little bit differently, uh, but it will still apply. So, you know, we have in our sort of gates of lean analytics, we have a section on virality. And so, you know, then if we look at, we, we do it primarily by business model. So we say, okay, in a e-commerce model um, at this stage, in the, you know, in the viral stage of an e-commerce model, what does that mean? What might the number look like that you want to go for? In a, um, in a two-sided marketplace, you know, what are the, the numbers that you need to look at? And we use our gates primarily, which sort of have the engines of growth baked into them a little bit. All right. Um, okay, so I received a question here. What's the easiest way to incorporate A-B testing in early stage validation? Or do you start with basic measurements first and introduce A-B at a later stage? Um, that's a great question. I think that Generally, I don't think about using A-B early on because A-B testing tends to assume you know what you want to test. So it depends on how early we're talking about. But, um, you know, early on, it's problem interviews and, and um, solution interviews. And that's really sort of the, you know, the classic code of getting out of the building. And that's absolutely important. When you start to get some 
um, sense of the answers you're getting and you start to see patterns in there, and if the patterns look interesting, then we talk about getting answers at scale. And what that means is it could mean things like doing surveys. It could mean things like doing surveys and A-B testing. So you, 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 maybe you do 20 customer interviews, uh, problem interviews, or, or maybe you've done 20 solution interviews, you're starting to see some patterns in there that are interesting to you, and now you've put up a landing page with two unique value propositions. But you wouldn't start with A-B testing until you have some qualitative data that tells you what you should A, uh, what you should A-B test on. Um, okay, so I got another question here. I understand the value of the canvas from a reflection point of view and for group communication, but what's the value of looking back at prior canvases as time progresses? So, there's not necessarily a ton of value in looking back on canvases, um, and I think this is one of the reasons why if you look at what Ash Moria is doing with his Lean Canvas, he's been developing other tools that are much more about the, the nitty-gritty, the day-to-day, -day, and the Problem Solution Canvas is really about that. So we, I'm less interested in um, looking back at the Problem Solution Canvas, except maybe for the previous week. So let's say we're, you know, week 17, and you told me that these were your main problems in week 17, and this is what you were going to go do to try to solve those problems, and this is what your targets were. Well, then in week 18, we're going to go back and look at that. But I don't really care about what happened in week 16 and 15 anymore, because it's really about focusing today. Um, so it's less about sort of keeping a historical, I think it's still interesting, but that's not really the goal. It's really about looking forward. Um, Let's see here. So somebody asked uh, MVP, and I apologize. Yes, MVP means a minimum viable product. Um, uh, somebody asked here, what is, when is the final version of the book available? So I believe the publishing date has been set for February 2013. Okay, so what common metric determines you have reached product market fit? So I, I don't think there's one specific metric here that determines this. I think if we, if we think of the, the engines of growth, um, when you start, and, and it's just dependent on your type of business. There's no one single metric. Um, but if you look at the engines of growth, or if I think of the, the gates of analytics, and you're going from um, uh, empathy to, to stickiness to virality, it's at the virality stage where we start to think, okay, this is working, and we're starting to see growth here. Um, and, and I always think of B2B SaaS, but there's certainly other business models. But, you know, it, it's a sort of a combination of metrics that tell you you've built this engine that's working. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a purely scientific thing. Um, it, it's a bit of science and a bit of guts that these numbers are tracking in the right direction and scaling in a way that you feel like you can build a legitimate business. And now you're willing to take the risk to spend the money you need to spend to acquire users because you think that they're going to react and act the same way that your previous uh, ones have. Um, okay, so somebody asked, how is the free sneak peek PDF on the website different from the paid sneak peek ebook? The, the ebook um, that is paid is the early release copy. Um, if I'm not mistaken, but first of all, it has more content in it, but it also gets updated over time, whereas the free sneak peek was just a, a little snapshot. Um, just checking to see if there's any other questions. Okay, so this is a good question. Um, these are tricky questions. How much history do you need before you start looking at churn percentage, and would you compare churn on two different products that don't overlap and might have different audiences? So um, I think churn is something that you want to look at fairly early, um, but it clearly doesn't matter if you can't get activation. So if you have a, some form of a funnel, people are some, I'm just going to use this as an assumption, you know, people are coming to your site, they're signing up, so you've got some amount of conversion, you have enough there to test that the people who do sign up um, are using your product or activating. If that number is too low, it almost doesn't matter what churn is, because the assumption is that churn will be very high if very few people activate, because they're probably just not that interested. So if the activation is high enough that people are coming in and then they churn, 
then that's really when you want to start to look at that number. Um, so I, I do feel like it's fairly early. Um, it's fairly early on because it's one of those things where a, a lot of companies focus on just putting people in the top of the funnel. And then when you come to the bottom of the funnel, it's almost too late to be like, well, what happened to all those people? And once they're gone, they're gone. It's very hard to get people back. And so I would say it's fairly early in the process. Um, you know, can you compare churn um, between two businesses? It's really hard to know without the specifics, but I would, I would generally say I, you, you can. Um, but that's with the caveat of, well, what are those businesses and is there any, you know, relation to them that that makes sense? Um, and more than comparing two different sort of products that don't overlap in terms of audiences, I think what you want to do is get enough people into each funnel, if you will, that you, you, have, uh, you can start to create your own benchmarks. And then instead of comparing the two products in different audiences, try to find other benchmarks of similar products. And again, that's partially what we're trying to do in the book. We won't answer that for everybody. But if you, say, you know, if you have a product in a certain vertical targeting a certain audience, can you find other people there who are not competitive who can help you? Um, yeah, so I got a, this is a great question as well. So could you apply this to marketing channels as well to iterate that through in order to find market channel fit? So yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the analytics around channels are things like, you know, um, cost of acquisition. So, you know, a channel could be using AdWords, a channel could be a partner. So um, being able to look at each of your channels and which one is the most effective for you from a, um, and let's say we're talking about dollars, so which one is the most effective from a, a dollar's perspective, which one costs the least but drives um, the most high value people. So, you know, a customer from AdWords versus a customer that comes from Facebook advertising, which one churns less, which one's lifetime value is higher. Um, if you can, if you can um, instrument that and track that, that analytics, and you find, you know, Facebook ads work better than Google AdWords, well, then you're going to put more money into Facebook ads. So absolutely, and this would work with partners as well. How long does it take to ramp partner A up versus partner B? And the customers that partner A brings me, what's the quality of those customers versus partner B? Um, so uh, this, is, this, is, this is another good, good, uh, good question. So any advice on guerrilla tactics from below for introducing an analytical approach to an organization? So this is an area that we're still fleshing out in the book. Um, but, uh, you know, I was just talking to somebody today about this, and I said, you know, the, the simplest thing to do, and, and this was a big organization, that, like, we have lots of data. They're like, well, lots of data is really fine, and I'm glad you're collecting that data, but why don't you pick one business problem that you know um, somebody in your business has. You don't necessarily have it, but somebody has it. Maybe it's conversion on the website. Maybe it's churn. Uh, maybe it's something else. And hone down to that one metric that matters and, you know, either work with them to build experiments or find a way to build an experiment on the side. Um, so instead of maybe touching um, the core product that you can't maybe be involved in, maybe you can help with, you know, a great example is onboarding. Can you do something on the onboarding side or can you do something with the website that affects the one metric like conversion from free to pay trial, uh, you know, free trial to pay conversion? And if you can hone in on a simple number and hone in on simple experiments and show that you've just increased value and say, well, look, we just changed the way we onboard people. We didn't change the core product. We just changed a little bit of onboarding and all of a sudden those customers activate more, use the product more, and dot, 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 the value of that is could be this if we were to deploy this to everybody. That's a great way of people realizing, wow, you know, this data, even though it's one simple number, can make a huge difference. Oh, so um, somebody asked here, you know, what does 2.5% churn mean? So I was giving an example in a SaaS business um, of that being a benchmark that we found, which is 2.5% of your customers um, leave you every month. And so that was sort of the benchmark that we've found so far in our research that says, um, if you can get your churn to that rate, 2.5% of your customers leave per month, obviously you want it to be zero, but if you can get to about that range, you're in a good range and you know that churn isn't, isn't the, the core number one problem of your business. Um, 
Um, so the next question is how important is it to look at the entire funnel, so using pirate metrics um, as the example with respect to each channel rather than just the A and the A? Um, and I think it's actually very important. So um, you, you might find that, um, you know, we'll just use Twitter and Facebook, you know, two sources of traffic. And you might find that a lot of Twitter users, you know, more Twitter users come, uh, which is wonderful, and maybe even a lot of uh, Twitter users activate, but then they all turn out and they don't buy. And so, you know, you're, you're going to double down on that channel and you're going to spend more money on that channel and you're going to focus on that channel. You might even drop the other one only to realize that, yeah, you got a lot of flow. It just wasn't high quality. Um, and so you, you really do want to focus on the whole funnel. Now, if you don't have the funnel in place, like you don't have um, referral in place, you don't have revenue in place yet, then you focus on the pieces you have. So if you have activation and you're just trying to get users in, then what you want to focus on is not necessarily referrals or virality or revenue, you want to focus on do they stay with the product and are they active. Um, and so, you know, and then you define that, you know, however you define active, that's a good user versus a bad user. So, Yasmina, I don't have any other questions coming in. There may still be some. Uh, we have a few minutes still. Sure, just taking a look here to see what we have, some fresh ones that just came in, and we sure do. Let me put them in your queue for you. And, folks, we are here at Q&A. If you have not opened that group chat and you do have a question for Ben, please open it, type it in, send it in while he's with us, and he will answer it. Okay, here come two more for you, Ben. Okay, so um, somebody asked, is there a free open source community supported platform for capturing and reporting startups? Oh, I think I already had that one. And I actually don't know the, maybe that came in and I'm looking at it wrong. I apologize. But that's something I'm going to follow up on and see. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, so what quantity of users would you say should be used to flow through the funnel for adequate measurements? And so, um, you know, the, the, unfortunately the answer for that is it depends. Um, but I will say this, I think fewer users than you probably think about right now. Um, and so this, I think, is a common, you know, granted, you'll have 100 people come to your site, you know, it's not statistically significant, but it's probably enough to generate um, insights from those users. And some of that may be quantitative, like 100 people came to my site and only, um, you know, two of them signed up. Well, that's, that's probably a good indication something's wrong. Um, when we get into the murkier middle of things, like, you know, 100 people came and, you know, 25 signed up, is that good, is that bad? So maybe the benchmarks in the book help, maybe you say, I need more data. Um, so it really does depend, but I would say generally it's probably less than you think before the, the data is, so you need less data than you think for the data to be um, actionable and valuable. Um, so the question is, isn't using Lean Startup Analytics or Lean Analytics harder to realize for B2B since sales cycles are longer? Um, it's harder to come up with effective metrics. So, I mean, it depends on, on your B2B model. So I use B2B Freemium, which is generally a, you know, drive as much quality traffic to the site, get them to convert into a free trial, and then convince them inside of the app that they should upgrade. Um, and so, you know, metrics work very well there. You know, longer sales cycle, it's, it's harder. So if you're selling enterprise software, it's definitely harder because the sales cycle is longer. But, but it's still a value. You know, the sales cycle process might be longer, um, but you can still measure things like the value of the customers. You can still measure things like churn. So the channel side of it might be a little bit harder because it might be uh, through salespeople or different things or partnerships, and it's harder to instrument that. But the actual use of the application, the onboarding, the use, the ongoing use and the churn you can, and the revenue, you can certainly still measure. Okay, so what metrics should you be using for large structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data sets aligned to what's qualitative or quantitative? Um, you know, I don't actually have a really simple answer to that question. I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's almost always a combination of both. This is the kind of thing where we would need to really look at the data and, and, and I'd have to look at it in more detail to really start brainstorming ideas of what we should be doing with it. Um, I think that if you have a lot of structured data, it certainly leans more to quantitative and it leans more to exploratory metrics. 
Um, and I'm thinking about a, a case study uh, that we have in the book uh, for Circle of Moms, which was a social network um, on Facebook, and it didn't originally start as Circle of Moms. And what happened was they saw, you know, they had millions of users, and this is the early days when Facebook opened themselves up for apps. Um, they had millions of users, but the activation and the usage was pretty low. And, but then, you know, one night, one of the founders starts digging through the data, and he, he sees that there's patterns with moms. Moms are, you know, I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were significantly uh, more involved, more active, doing more stuff. And that, you know, exploration of that data allowed them to pivot to um, circle of moms and focusing almost exclusively on, on that target audience. So I think that question really just depends on what the data is, what it looks like, uh, what are the use cases and things that you're focusing on? But I think in almost all cases, when we're looking at data, it, it's a combination of qualitative and quantitative. And so if you look at things, you know, in the circle of mom's case, they looked at it, they saw that, you know, there was this, these strange, not strange, but these usage patterns for moms that were really compelling, but they didn't just, you know, flip a switch and start focusing on moms, they started talking to moms. And that was using quantitative data to go get qualitative feedback. Um, is there anything better than a cohort study for tracking actionable metrics? Um, I think cohort analysis overall is very useful. Um, you know, I, is it the only way to track an actionable metric? Not necessarily. But if you're not looking at different groups of people or at least different groups of time, um, it's very hard to compare the numbers that you're getting. Um, and so, you know, cohort analysis from that perspective is very important, but I, I, I'm not saying it's absolutely required for tracking actionable metrics, but it definitely helps. Oh, this is a great question. So how do you recommend startup metrics be presented before the board? So um, we do, we will be talking about this in the book in some detail. Um, you know, I generally, um, so when I was a founder of Standout Jobs, I was always nervous about showing my numbers, and then when you flip over and you're an investor in companies or an advisor, all you want is for companies to show you the dashboards. And so generally, I, um, I go to, to the latter, which is show them your metrics, show them your dashboards. There's no reason not to do that. Um, but what you do want to do is you want to make sure that you've um, bubbled up those numbers that you really want people to focus on because you show somebody a spreadsheet of data or a dashboard of data and they're going to start focusing on things that you don't necessarily want them focusing on. Um, I will also say that, you know, we talk about vanity metrics as being bad. There's something to be said for the use of vanity metrics in certain circumstances. I'm not proposing that you use them with investors because your investors should be smart enough to realize they're just vanity numbers. But it's not a bad way to say, you know, here's a number users are going up, but, you know, we're concerned about this and this is what we're focused on. And um, when one company in particular that I work with at Year One Labs uh, called Local Mind, um, in their board meetings, they would just have simple goals and they would say, you know, our goal is to hit this number by the next board meeting and it would be, uh, you know, a red, yellow, green sort of result. So very, very simple. If, if investors want to dig more, you do that, but in a board meeting, you really just want to focus on key issues, sort of like using the problem solution canvas. And, and we have an example I've seen in the book where a company was using the problem solution canvas with their board because they were really focusing on key business decisions. And so that might be a useful tool for you, um, you know, trying to present to your board. Um, so any case studies for applying lean analytics to enterprise software sales cycle? Um, I don't know if we have any today. Um, at, at right, right now, but I definitely do want to get some in there. Um, so, uh, you know, Salesforce and, and GoInstant, which is, you know, my co the company I work for today, is an enterprise software sales company, and so, and I know there's a lot of people in that business, um, and so it is something that we do want to focus on, uh, but right now we don't. Generally speaking, you know, most startups we see aren't in that, you know, enterprise software business. Uh, they tend to lean to, well, kind of, most startups these days are in consumer businesses, but the, 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 the ones that are enterprise are usually, um, as you point out, sort of freemium uh, for SMBs. So that's probably going to be the focus, but we do want to get examples in there for enterprise companies.
All right, uh, Yasmin, I don't see any other questions coming in. No additional questions have come in, Ben. As we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, I think, you know, something I, I probably said, but, you know, I, I'd like to say a little bit more, or, or the message here is use um, lean analytics or analytics com or, or combined with um, lean startup to provide you with a framework and the discipline and sort of to be rigorous in the processes that you employ. Um, but don't get lost in the process. Don't get lost in a methodology. Use this to guide you and help you and use it as a way of keeping you honest. I think that's something that startups and entrepreneurs really uh, struggle with is what I would describe as intellectual honesty. And so if you can look at numbers and take a step back and be intellectually honest with yourself, you can make better decisions for your business in the long run. Perfect. And with that, Ben, we're going to say a very big thank you to you for talking to us about the upcoming book, for sharing tips and great information and sneak peeks. We do appreciate your time and your expertise. Folks that attended, we thank you for attending today's webcast and hope you benefited from it. We would like to let you all know the book, Ben's book, is the O'Reilly Deal of the Day, and you can pre-order it and get some good information right now, early release. It is available right now. Go to O'Reilly.com. Look on the right-hand side. You can't miss it. It's right there. Get it today. Save yourself some money. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, have a startup, or in business, and you need to make decisions and take your company to the next level, you need this book. It's got lots of good information and tips for you that will help you in your day-to-day. Um, again, we thank you, Ben. Thank you, everyone. Oh, one more thing I'd like to let you know. When the book is finished, we will be holding another webcast with Ben and his co-author, Alistair Kroll. So please keep an eye out on your emails for that date, and you can come prepared with all your good questions for them. Again, thank you, Ben. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.